very warm welcome to everyone joining this session. Uh, good morning to you uh, from Davos in Switzerland, Grützi. Um, my name's Helena, I'll be moderating this session. Really glad to have such an amazing panel with us. And we'll also be having lots of audience uh, participation, so please get ready for that. Um, I'm a uh, consumer advocate and activist. Uh, I represent 100 uh, countries, 200 organizations in 100 countries uh, with NGOs that are calling, fighting for a fair, safe, and sustainable marketplace for all of us. We have consumer rights. Um, and let's face it, the, the marketplace needs to change. So I'm really excited to be having uh, this discussion this morning. Really glad uh, that the forum team has given us the space. Uh, let's face it, civil society is uh, pressed at the moment and being able to have this open um, senior level dialogue is fantastic. Um, our title for the session this morning, and we've only got 45 minutes to cover possibly one of the biggest topics facing us, is climate action starts at home. And part of me seeing this was like, yes, we need to feel this in, not just in our home, in our heart, in our head. Um, we know so many people around the world, 70% uh, according to Globescan, know that this is a crucial pressing issue. More people are willing to take political action, to call on their, you know, on, on, the, on their communities, on their governments to take action. Um, we know that this is something where we need to lean in um, and, and move forward. And on the other hand, no, you know, cost of living crisis. How, how can this be something that I take on board in addition to everything else? Um, how, how do I get the right information? How do, how do I make those choices? Are those choices available to me? And so this is a nuanced question, which is so often the case in Davos, which is good. Um, and I think we're going to explore all of those pieces. But what's for sure is we need to be working together to move forward, we need to find that tipping point to a different type of marketplace. And that's why we'll explore each of those pieces in turn. Um, on the panel with me, I'm delighted to have uh, the full range of uh, the multi-stakeholder dialogue. To my left, we have a, an amazing global shaper. Uh, Alejandro is from Venezuela, but also Colombia. Um, do you want to introduce yourself very briefly? Uh, of course. Thanks, Helena. My name is Alejandro. I'm from Venezuela slash Colombia, and a young climate advocate and advocate for air pollution and refugees' rights in different countries of Latin America, and a global shaper from the World Economic Forum. Shireen. I'm Shireen Al-Khatsib, and I uh, manage the shopping malls business as CEO for Majid al Futaim, a company based in Dubai but operates in the MENA region. And I don't work on climate change, but I'm very aware of the subject due to the fact that I work for Majid al Futaim, an organization that has a very solid agenda on sustainability. Brilliant. Teresa, Deputy Prime Minister from Spain, but would you like to say a few words and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm currently Deputy Prime Minister for Spain, but I've been working on climate for 20 years, so I advocate for climate. <clears throat> and uh, and um, uh, we deal with uh, how to make the transformation of our system much more resilient on climate and environmental terms, but socially fair day-to-day. Uh, -day. And it's true that it is not so easy. And the aspects of uh, justice are very important to, to succeed. Yeah. Rebecca. Hi, morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Marmot. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever. Massively passionate about trying to do something to tackle climate change uh, and here to talk a little bit about the role of business in, in really stepping up and doing that. Awesome. Coming to the audience, right? So the, the team was great and said, yeah, let, let's start with that participation, which is the best bit. Would anybody in the audience like to share what's your personal motivation uh, for making sure that climate action starts at home? Um, or what's your reaction to the title of this session? I'm going to be ruthless and ask you for like a 10-word answer, which I know is impossible, but anybody want to react to that briefly? Please. I have four children. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm not sure we can top that, but... <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, you're quiet this morning. No, sir, please. Um, I'm from Egypt. My home is in the Nile Delta. 30 million people could find themselves underwater very soon. Perfect, thank you. Good start. And we're going to keep coming back to the audience, um, so please get your questions or comments ready. 
So this, uh, this is a systemic shift, right? It's one of those things that's really complicated. Um, when we go to, to foundations to ask for help, they say, but what's your theory of change? How exactly do you expect to get from A to B? Which is a great question. So I want to come to you first, Alejandro. Um, and, you know, you are doing amazing work with your organisation. Um, how do you turn the youth voice into that systemic change? I'll start by saying that the average age of our world leaders right now is 62, yet over 40% of the population on the planet are under 25. So we are seeing how the youth is regularly um, deferred from the spaces where decision makers are taking decisions. And the truth is that we're going to inherit the decisions that decision makers are making today about our planet, about our future. And youth people, young people, the youth movements, have organized a strong mobilization for, to take climate action and other issues. Um, and I have done so as well with the optimism that we can change the future. Uh, I'm the director of El Derecho No Ser, our organization in Colombia that seeks to empower young people to change unjust realities. In the last four years, we have mobilized over 200,000 people in Colombia to take action for the, for the issues they care the most. And I believe our, I mean, this is what we have done in our theory of change, and we have proved it, that in order to engage young people and to pass from A to mobilizations to real influence, we need to do three things. Or, or at least we propose that we do three things. First, we need to spark conversations, such as this one, where we engage with different stakeholders. It will be ideal that it happens on the public space. And that these conversations are around the policies that we care, what are the issues that we want to debate, and that we can create really good accountability mechanisms. Second, we need to create strong coalitions and networks. These, com these networks happen from people and organizations that go conversation to conversation. And they go from the words to concrete actions and proposals. And third, we need to mobilize. And I suggest, I, I really believe in something we call symbolic actions, meaning mobilizations that engage the media, but also the public officials, and shape the agenda of the narrative in the conversation. To put a concrete small example, we put a giant cigarette box in the middle of the main square of Bogota, saying, Bogo smoke, bring this air, it's damaging to your health. And that was a shock for the public agenda <laughs> in Bogota, because it really made a statement of, we need to worry about air pollution. So I do believe that in order to create this youth engagement and build broad-based citizen coalitions, we need to give power to people that have been historically unheard. And that particularly leads to young people. And the best way to do it is to start a conversation. And then what? So do you find that you're then given that decision-making ability afterwards? You make the environment so uncomfortable to not listen to you that you open the space. So it is a tricky move because you need to be uncomfortable. You need to make people feel, mm, I need to take another decision. And then it, can only be, it cannot only be attacked, then you negotiate and then you start creating proposals. And we always say mobilizations, yes. Climate strikes, yes, with proposals. You need to open the door and then you come with a strong, with a strong proposal and afterwards, the most important is that young people can interact with the public officials and in mo one moment become public officials to change their realities and the public policies. Teresa, this would be a perfect place for you to come in. How do, would you see this sort of broader, how do we get to that future marketplace and how would you respond and give advice to Alejandro as well? Okay, thank you, thank you. First, I would like to say that uh, this um, session saw how to build a theory of change and how to make change happen is very important. And I think that uh, in order to, to succeed, we need to understand where the barriers are and where the levers are. My main message back to Alejandro is to not stay as a, a force to denounce, but to stay as activists with concrete proposals and uh, be sure that you cannot despair. I mean, those being aware of the situation cannot despair. There are many people who do not understand yet. And I think that there is a cognitive bias that we need to challenge and that we need to face. So it's not, oh, they are crazy people. They don't understand anything. Uh, I, I'm, I'm angry. That's, that's not the way to, to, to promote change. And change is not easy. To me, the main barriers are 
uh, at least four. The first of them being a, um, a, a big gap between um, a, uh, the headlines and the action. So when you come into the, implement, into the implementation, you find that people is not so uh, easily going with the changes in lifestyles. Uh, um, because, second big barrier, I think that there is a gap of knowledge, a gap of understanding. It has been so long that we thought that growth was the main driver for development, that understanding prosperity in a different manner is very difficult. And understanding the limits of growth, the difficulties of overshooting, what we've got uh, could create additional cost is not so easy. So we need to be quite uh, uh, easy going when explaining why it makes sense to make things differently. And it is not because you want to procrastinate anyone, but because you need to deliver this change. The, thing, the third thing is the time lag. So the impression that whatever we do today is for the benefit for whoever in the future is not always good news. Yes, I have three children too, and I, and I could uh, bet for my children, but still the, the, the gap between the theory and the action is still there. So we need to ensure that people benefit from the very first day of the changes. Otherwise, it could be very difficult to keep on the support of the people. So the fourth big barrier, and I think that they are all, uh, they all need to be combined, is the aspects dealing with equity and inequalities, the distributional impacts of the change, the social measures we need to introduce so that those workers feeling that they are menaced have other options that are real because they need to get an earning for their, for their families. Those that feel the menace of being threatened by physical situations have an option to, 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 to provide a, um, a different um, setting. Those that feel menace uh, because of uh, the transformational, the lack of skills to develop other capacities have been a skill to have new capacities. So I think that we always need to think on the social aspects, inequalities dealing with uh, physical impacts, with workforce and skills, with um, a, uh, needs to, 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 to develop uh, alternatives and not just because it is a must. Yes, of course it is a must, but we need to, to find out the, the ways out. Perfect, thank you so much. With this, I'd like to come to um, the two panelists who are in leadership positions at organizations, businesses that have seen this not as, you know, well, our consumers have to bear the brunt of this. We're actually going to try and support them through this. How do we innovate? How do we think about our business model in a very fundamental way? Because that has to work differently in the future marketplace. And I think that's really exciting. And we'll come to sort of thinking about scope three in a little bit. Rebecca, can I come to you first? Sort of what's your approach to thinking about, you know, um, well, climate action starts at, at home. How would you support your consumers in that transition? So, I think we've we've learned quite a lot over the last 12 or 13 years around how to best engage consumers. So back in 2010, we, we launched our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, and we really put a lot of effort and emphasis on big consumer campaigns around trying to engage people to, if you're using washing machine, wash at a lower temperature, use a low volume shower head, a whole variety of different things. And to your point, Helena, really trying to encourage consumers, but what we actually realized was and it, that would have some impact, but actually, if you want to see proper long-term sustained change, back to your question about the theory of change, I think you've got to take a very structured approach. So you know, we, we also have a four-stage model, which is get your own house in order first. So when we look across our portfolio, you know, two and a half billion people use our products every single day. So there is a massive opportunity, but also huge responsibility to actually put an innovation lens on climate change. So for example, we're taking all of the fossil fuel based carbon out of our home care portfolio. We're replacing it with green carbon or blue carbon. So really thinking from an R&D perspective, how do we provide products in the first place that are more climate friendly? Then the second stage is, well, what do you do across your value chain? So if you think of, of our portfolio from the sourcing of raw materials and crops and commodities through to working with retailers, how can we make a difference there? So tons and tons of work around sustainable sourcing, really trying to shift. And I, and I think your point was really interesting around not trying to, to demonize people that aren't necessarily doing it, the, doing it in the way that we would hope, but take people on a journey. So for example, for us, it's 
it started with sustainable sourcing. It's now shift to, to, to renewable agriculture. So really thinking about regen ag, how can we actually turn the work that we're doing with our farmers into something positive when it comes to climate change? The third part, which is the really big opportunity for us, then is using the power of our brand. So how do we put really climate-friendly consumer campaigns out there, but without, to the original point, putting all the emphasis and onus just on the consumers. So it's really a sense of working together with consumers. So we've still carried on doing turn down your washing machine, but we've also tried to look at other things that we can do. So uh, microdosing, thinking about using, if you're washing by hand, two buckets of water uh, instead of three. And then lastly, it's things like this. It's working pre-competitively on industry level collaboration so we partnered uh, with the British government at COP26 in Glasgow uh, really tried to galvanize a lot of energy behind the race to zero making sure that other organizations together with Unilever were setting that zero targets and I think crucially as well putting a climate transition action plan in place which we did and, and, and took to our annual general meeting in 2021 that actually lays out road marks along the way because I think for all of us we talk about net zero targets and 2030 and 2039, but we haven't got till then to, to make a difference. So I think having interim targets as well is really important. And that builds loyalty with your stakeholders because it really is something tangible for, for people to grip onto. Thank you. Now, you'll notice that the two businesses here are close, really close to consumers. I think they're the ones who sort of feel that connection and that, that sort of that, that connection with consumers and their desire to shift. So it's great to have both Unilever and Majid El Futaim, which is one of the largest uh, retail and shopping mall uh, uh, organizations in the Middle East. Um, Shireen, would you tell us a little bit about um, how you're approaching this? Um, perhaps also start with your personal motivation to, to, okay. for okay. change as well. So basically in recent years, uh, there has been a lot of news and information as well as warnings about climate action and climate change. And this raised my awareness and uh, enforced my sense of responsibility. So at home with my family, we've taken active measures to change our behaviors when it comes to water and electricity consumption. Uh, we ban single-use plastic at home. We recycle whatever we can recycle. Uh, so we've gotten to a point where we are borderline sting stingy, I would say. Um, when I look at these uh, actions that we do at home, they seem insignificant given the bigger picture. However, I like to think that others are doing it and that by doing so, this can add up to a real impact that would make businesses and governments rethink the way they approach how they're gonna to cater to um, uh, consumers. Uh, on, a, on an organizational level, uh, at Majid al Futaim, we have a, uh, an ambitious sustainability um, strategy that we've been working on for the past six years. And uh, given our uh, net positive targets for 2040, whereas most other targets are net zero by 2050 or 2060. We've embarked on many, many initiatives that we campaigned both internally and externally across different uh, media channels. And uh, we have made uh, progress on our energy usage, water consumption, our carbon footprint. And these initiatives spanned across all of our portfolios, starting from shopping malls and retail stores to hotels and integrated communities, as well as leisure and entertainment venues. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we also embarked on a digital transformation, which we feel will play a big role in how consumers um, change their uh, behaviors. And uh, we launched Store of the Future last December in Mall of the Emirates, our flagship mall. And Store of the Future is a space with, with deeply curated touch points using cutting edge technology, sensors, video collaboration, digital screens, augmented reality, and a demo room for analytics and insights. Uh, this format of retail is going to encourage tenants to explore possibilities of how they um, exhibit their products and services uh, in a way that introduces the digital dimension to the shopper yet it's in a physical space. So here you have the digital element and it builds on our omni-channel strategy at Majid al-Futaim. Um, 
This format re reduces really the negative impact on the environment when you think of a scenario with zero stocking, zero returns, limited transportation, and other um, environmental friendly approaches that, uh, that, that this space offers. Uh, the interesting thing is that it offers a new customer experience, and I'm sure the customers will like it because it is a mix of digital and digital, and given that e-commerce was on the rise the past few years and still is, uh, this space will be a destination that people would want to experience. And hopefully, other brands would adopt this format, and then this would shape, reshape the industry uh, as more and more tenants choose to um, introduce their format in their retailing. Awesome. What I love is that fourth industrial revolution should be for sustainability, right? I mean, what, what, the, what is the point of this technology if it's not actually helping people for the future? So let's, let's bring those things together. Let's talk briefly about information. As a consumer advocate, I often get brought in to talk about labeling. I don't think that's, you know, that, that's very complicated, unfortunately, for consumers because we have you know, thousands of different labels. It would be lovely to have some level of simplicity. But that's not the only way in which we need to get informed. Um, perhaps, you know, we could ask, uh, Teresa, could I come back to you, Rebecca, and perhaps Shireen a little bit on how, how you sort of engage consumers in this with, with the right type of, and citizens. I'm talking about citizens in the marketplace, and so that's my shorthand for consumers. Don't worry. I'm not talking about consumerism, which is a totally different thing. Consumer rights in the marketplace. Teresa. No, thank you, and I, I like this approach of citizens, and citizens do, yeah. do play an important role as consumers, and I think that it's true that information and knowledge is absolutely key. I was saying that this is one of the bias and gaps, yeah, how we understand the risk of not doing, uh, how we understand the pathways, so reducing the sense of threat for those feeling the threat, um, and how make, we make things easy. I think that we cannot um, either uh, ask anyone being a hero uh, on every single minute of his or her day-to-day -day life. So we need to be responsible and understanding what it means, what we do. Um, and I think that uh, this is a very comprehensive task. I think that governments and officials in general terms, we have the obligation to make it easy and to ensure that there is uh, access to the relevant information on the benefits uh, and, the, um, and the risk of doing and of not doing. And that we, we, I think that we need to be flexible and boosting what it works and, and, and changing or, or, or learning how to fine tune what it doesn't work. Um, but it is not only an issue of governments. And I think that we have also learned about that and you lead Everest and examples you have been saying about that. So uh, sorry, this is not only regulating the information or the compulsory information for anyone willing to invest or willing to understand what is behind the, the, um, the information in your products or the information uh, for the financial authorities, uh, but also an issue of um, information within the companies and from the companies to their clients. What it means, how you get, what you get, what you are offering, what are the risks of your, what you are offering and why it may be a little bit more costly or why it is in the, in the mid and long run much more effective what you are providing. And, and I think that the big gap there as consumers <laughs> is um, this, uh, as I say, this, this understanding that consuming a lot is much better. And I think that this is lifestyle that we need to change. So I think that, uh, yes, we need to, to, to educate on, a, how we say, sound, science grounded uh, um, information uh, for, for the public opinion, not just for the uh, um, official educational programs, but also in terms of the public awareness, what it means and what the, different, the different impact of what you do or what you don't do, or what you regulate or what you not regulate is important. This is why I think that the whole the understanding of um, this taxonomy process, so to provide information to the financial institutions, but in a way that it is clear for the general public is very important. And I think that a, um, campaigning on what all of this means is very important. And um, my impression is that we as governments cannot stick just to the regulation uh, normal functions, but uh, we also need to provide a, a good sound uh, and careful basis for access 
to very critical information on why we do, why we do not do, why do change the regulation and so on. And uh, um, the civil society, not only corporates, but only the, the, the general public, the, the, the social associations, um, have a very important role to play. My, my experience is that, as I said, everybody sticks to the headline, but when you go down to the ground, uh, um, there has been no preparation, not even sufficiently, it's not easy, eh? but not even sufficiently to, 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 to create the space for building consensus on how to change uh, or why to accept the change. So I think that, um, that this is an important, uh, an important uh, piece to, to tick. And my final comment is on workers and trade unions because um, they have a very relevant social partners, business and, and, and workers have a very important role to play. And, um, and, uh, and uh, the, the way traditionally trade unions have worked to defend the rights um, uh, is evolving. So to understand that the employment is very much linked to, to this transformation. Uh, and uh, I was commenting on the skilling process. So, so uh, um, understanding the risk, the benefits, and experiencing the benefits and avoiding the risk is absolutely key and has different levels of action that need to be, to be accelerated uh, um, uh, simultaneously. Yeah, thank you for bringing up transparency because that sort of level of transparency can help for you know, individuals in the home, but also like we can start to see what's happening throughout the supply chain and where things are, where things are landing. Rebecca, how do, you, how do you think about the communication and information exchange here? So in our experience and, and all the research we get when we speak to consumers, most people want to buy products or services from companies and organizations that are really trying to tackle climate change, tackle social inequality. But often there is, you know, it's quite overwhelming when you go into a store and you know, one company will have a, a carbon labeling process based on one methodology and someone else will have something else. And you know, people say, it says 10, is that good? Is it bad? I don't know. So I think what we've tried to do is set up an industry-wide consortium. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, the Eco Beauty uh, Consortium which Unilever is a part of, but together with L'Oreal and many others uh, in the personal care sector, have agreed a basic methodology to be much more transparent to consumers around uh, around sustainability. So, trying to communicate in a, in a, in a much easier, uh, consumer-friendly way to understand around carbon footprint or around sustainable sourcing. I think tech is making a massive difference. I mean, we've been doing some trials where you can go in store, you can get your phone, you can zap the QR code, and you can see the different stages through through blockchain of whether where the product was originally sourced from, who's been involved uh, in manufacturing it, how it's got to where it is, what, who were the workers that were involved in that process. And I think the more transparency there is, the more then, you know, it's very circular, the more then consumers will come to expect and demand it. And so I think we need to make it easy and accessible for consumers. And we need to ensure that across the industry that there are these standardized methodologies. And then I think the last part is, you know, and I, I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, we have a responsibility together with many other companies who have big advertising and promotion budgets to put these kind of messages front and center. So really try and communicate to consumers, this is a win-win situation. It's going to cost you less, there's less packaging, it's a really effective product and it's better for the environment. And I think the more that we can integrate those kind of messages and enable consumers to make simple and easy choices, then the easier that it will be to make this totally mainstream. I want to come to you actually, and then and then back to Shireen. How do you want how do you want to learn about this? <clears throat> That's a good question, and I have a question for the audience. So if, oh, if you could on. if you could raise your hand if this happened to you, did you ever had a conversation on a school about what you were eating? If yes, please raise your raise your hand. I mean, in the school, not in, not with your family. Did you ever had a conversation about what we were eating in the school? I didn't. I mean, it never happened to me. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a good point of re to reflect about this conversation. I mean, thousands of children and young people are eating in schools food, and they're not. And we're not talking about what we're eating. And if they're talking about what they're eating, it's their parents. So it's not really a youth-led voice on that. So and I, and I, I, I've been hearing all this intervention, and like, that would be cool to happen. 
if it happened, <laughs> it should. I mean, if I were a, a young student again in school, I would love to do a, tra a traceability of the products that I'm eating to see, because if I'm a young children or I'm a, I'm a young advocate and I'm demanding change, and we have seen in Europe and in Latin America and Africa how many young people are demanding climate action. We have a climate strike tomorrow here in, in Davos. Um, the first step is talking. And I believe that um, allies, the talk of adults as allies, are sometimes afraid of giving young people a voice uh, because they're afraid of how that will, that will answer. And, and I always think, I think we should be afraid of silence. Uh, silence leads to bad decisions, bad consumer decisions. We should be able to, to see what we're eating, where does this come from, what are the social environmental costs of what we're eating, and that information, that traceability, that um, transparency, that's the ideal. If it doesn't happen, it, it will be yeah, bad decisions. Yeah, but yes, and, because you don't get the learning in school, and then what's the proportion of advertising that will tell you, you know, your exposure to advertising and messaging about what healthy eating is or healthy living is? You know, the balance of this is totally out of whack. So that would be really good to see. To see. Uh, happen and change. I just want to touch, and we're coming to the audience in ooh, three minutes. Can I ask about scope three? So this is one of the topics when, when you talk about uh, climate action by businesses, you know, these are divided into scope one, scope two, scope three. Um, scope one is, scope one and two are sort of very much what you control. Scope three is like 80% of the problem and it's across the supply chain. Thankfully, one business's scope three uh, uh, issue is other businesses one and two. So this is why we need to see much more collaboration amongst businesses so that we can support consumers. I'd love to come back to you, Teresa, to talk about now, when can we see a little bit more pressure uh, and a regulatory uh, approach uh, to really push for that, that movement to happen? Um, I don't have a very concrete answer to your question because it is not easy, but I think that it could be as soon as possible. And I think that we need a prepar the preparatory work to be very intensified, much more intensified. Because um, it uh, deals with uh, not only big corporates or big providers in the global supply chains, but also with very small providers, suppliers, sorry. And, and then I think that uh, we also need to think how we can accelerate this process in the small and, and medium enterprise. So to learn what it means, what they do, and how they can also benefit from a much more consistent uh, way to, to provide their own products to the, to the global value chains. I think that uh, what Rebecca was saying is also very important, how the, the different sectors do make their own assessments on what, what they, they need to, to do in order to be responsible, but also in order to improve, and which, which has economic benefits and long-lasting uh, um, uh, strategic uh, responses in, for their own business. And, uh, and my impression is that uh, this is, uh, what we need to avoid is uh, a clash between the impressively raising demand so to introduce a scope three through compulsory regulation or through the different contracts in the provider's uh, chain and the lack of capacity to respond that could create also some unfair situations. And, um, and this is why I think that it is not just um, a question of um, I come back to my previous comment, which I think Alejandro is right when saying, hey, we need to, to be a part of this discussion and we cannot stay silent. I think that it is not just a question of then I table and that's all. I think that we need to develop that, those capacities. And, um, and, and we, again, I always think that uh, as governments, as officials, have, we have a special responsibility. But institutions are not only governments. Big corporates have a very important institutional role to play. So it's not, um, and I think that you were pointing out to that situation too. It's not just to say, now I'm going to ask for this, and for that, and for that, and for that. It's, no, I, I also need to work with those small people that are working with us and are part of the big uh, um, gathering that, uh, that, uh, that provides uh, the final output from our company to ensure that they have the capacity to, to respond to these demands and to do their, the things in, a, in, the best possible, in the best possible manner. So my, um, 
most direct response to your question is probably sooner than expected, but it could be very important to use the, um, the time to be ready to, to, to be. I think that this is a race against time, we also know, so we need to accelerate the whole learning processes too. Yeah, because there we're talking about we're sitting at home, but there's an entire supply chain, which in some cases is quite condensed, and in other cases is you know, hundreds of thousands of suppliers, all of whom we need, we need to be thinking about how that works to support this change. Um, let's go to questions. I, I do want to, one of the things in our preparation though, Shireen, we were talking about this has to, we have to work on things that have purpose and we care about. And for you, that was water. And so I do want to give you a moment to talk about the approach that you took to, uh, to focus on water from a retail perspective. So can you just touch on that and get your questions ready? Okay. So, sorry. I'm asking them to get their questions ready, <laughs> okay. but to okay. listen to you as you, as you sort of share how okay. you approach the, the water story. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, we've made public awareness a key element of our sustainability strategy. And uh, therefore we adopted the same approach to cover our campaign of one drop means a lot, which is related to water consumption. Uh, Majid al uh, a few years ago surveyed 7,000 visitors uh, of our malls in UAE and in Oman. And uh, the findings told us that water usage or water shortage was the most um, uh, important concern that uh, the participants had. Uh, it ranked uh, above climate action, above uh, protecting natural resources, above energy usage. So therefore we decided to launch a campaign and we hosted stands in our various shopping malls where we engaged with the visitors, uh, raising their awareness on their uh, daily water consumption, uh, covering household cleaning, car washing and personal hygiene. Uh, we also had discussions with them where we created the awareness about a call for action and how they can uh, reduce their water usage. And uh, this was supported by call of action across many media platforms. Uh, it's also important to note that as an organization, Majid al Futaim has achieved a great reduction on water usage through our various practices. And we have been able to reduce from 5.8 million cubic meters in 2018 to 4.77 in 2020. It's also worth mentioning that over that period, we've increased our footprint by 40%. So for us, that's a major achievement. And we obviously campaign all of these initiatives uh, to create public awareness. So you link yeah. pe how people at home are mm. caring about water mm. to a process where you can help them engage in that and you take action uh, within your own walls. And it's sort of that, that systemic approach. All right, climate action starts at home. Yes, we care deeply everywhere, but we need decent information. We need transparency. This is a systemic change. So we need to think about people's lives, their jobs, their, the supply chains that we need to disrupt to make this happen. It's coming faster than we think. Um, all of this change needs to happen faster than we think, actually. Um, and, you know, let's, let's really sort of get your energy. We were talking this morning. I think Alejandro is getting more energetic through the course of Davos, and I'm just feeling more exhausted. So the future is, is, needs to be with us, and we need to work together. Questions from the audience. If I can be... I'm a British introvert, so it's really hard. I could talk to you for three hours, but I can, can I ask you for a 30-second question? Sir. Yes. Uh, Thank you. It's a question related to your organization, Unilever, which has made great progress on sustainability. But you've come more recently under a lot of pressure from your financial investors saying, well, you're using sustainability as an excuse not to deliver shareholder value. So I just want to understand how you're dealing with that. And, and also to Alejandro and Teresa, what should governments and civil society do to support an organization like Unilever when it comes such an, under such an attack? Perfect. I'm going to gather a couple of questions, if there are any from the audience. <laughs> No, no, we're going, to get, we're going to answer that, but I want to, in interest of time, come on, don't be shy. This is great. At the, at the back, yes, thank you. 
Um, my group is the Grandmother Collective. We look at ways that elder women in particular can be uh, assets in development around the world. And I've heard of programs where elder women grandmothers will be educating different groups in society about best practices around ecological uh, practices day to day. And I was wondering if uh, any of you thought that that was an interesting way to activate these key actors in the domestic sphere? By, sorry, clarify your question for me, by, go, by working with an older generation. Uh, yes, I, sorry to use like some, like sort of like Avon ladies. Got it, okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Any other questions in the audience? We're ready. Who wants to go? I, I want so, to answer his question about what civil society to go. <laughs> yeah, no, you ready, I, Rebecca? Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Ahmed, because I mean, it's a, I think it's a, it's a really important question to address. So we have always believed at Unilever that when we put purpose and sustainability front and centre of our business strategy, which we do with what we call our Unilever compass, it helps us to actually grow the business in a sustainable way. So... For example, what we call our sustainable living brands, so where we really put sustainability at the heart of the consumer proposition. So brands like Dove or Ben & Jerry's, those brands grow twice as quickly as when we don't choose to actually talk about the sustainability message. And the other thing I'd say is our whole sustainability strategy is based around what we call the growth, trust, risk, cost matrix. So growing the brands, often sustainability means operating your business in a different way. So by setting up, for example, sustainable sourcing for really core crops and commodities for us, so cocoa or soy, it enables us to guarantee security of supply and at the same time working with farmers, uplifting them out of poverty and helping them to be more productive. Sometimes it actually just costs less, so we swap to renewable energy across all of our factories. It's, it's, it's saved us nearly a billion euros over the past 10 years. Um, and then finally, I'd say trust and talent. A lot of the people that come to work at Unilever come to work there because of the sustainability credentials and we're the top marketing recruiter in, in over 50 markets around the world. So I think all of that put together and when actually you look at how that results in us for, for, for growth, you know, I, I would challenge anyone who says that that, you know, that, that isn't the right model. Um, but it is a really important question to ask because I think you can end up otherwise in this binary, is it sustainability or growth? And it's not, it's about growing by putting sustainability at the heart of your business strategy. Yeah. Do you want to answer on the on the what can civil society do? If you look, the the increasing sense that not acting is a risk, because you know you're you're seeing greater uh, cases brought. You know where uh, civil society is saying you know, and investors are increasingly understanding this that you know consumers want to see a change you're seeing you know cases brought against companies for not acting or showing misleading information sort of saying ah oh, we're getting green this this is a, a i think there is something where uh, civil society can work even more with the financial community so that they value the right things Any i would on just that? add that i think it's a good idea both for unilever um, majid al futaim to support young people and support youth coalitions and youth voices. And, and I'm not sure if you have programs. I think Unilever has uh, programs to support young people, but supporting young people. And this is not only um, the people that work in your enterprise and are young. No, I mean, young people that are outside of your organization. It's a great way to connect with youth voices and then with the rest of the citizens. Um, if you have a good image of supporting coalitions of young people, the probability of them not backfiring is probably much more. And, and I think Helen agreed with me that we're, we're living in a culture that is really centric on backfiring on organizations that don't respect their own values. So I will say first is share your values because organizations have strong values, share them so we know them, and we're gonna be, account we're gonna be making accountability about that. So if you support us, we will be doing that accountability, but with much, much more support. So the, the question on older generations as well. Oh, How do we sorry, create intergenerational? No, no, no. I wanted you to answer that one, <laughs> and I want you to answer this one as well. How do you create the sort of overcome the intergen, perhaps an intergenerational divide? That's no, I mean right now that's well. completely true. If we believe that climate justice depends only on young people, we're doomed. It is an international intergenerational dialogue. Uh, for example, we're promoting intergenerational dialogues on Central America. 
to create a longer narrative around climate justice and migration. And the voices of the people, of the elderly people, are fundamental for this conversation. I mean, it needs to be an, ex an exchange where we are both on the same level. Um, and I do believe that it is not only the young that we're going to fight this, this battle. With that, we've come to the end of a 45-minute session on, on a topic that could have gone on much, much longer, and I hope it will. Please make this the start of a conversation with our panellists and amongst each other. Thank you so much for having been here. Become a consumer activist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.